Okay, good evening and welcome again to another Tuesday night lecture. Uh, the lecture series here is run by the Mid-Ulster Amateur Radio Club and uh, we're so glad if this is your first time or uh, your umpteenth time like some of you has joined us this evening, we're really glad you could join us. Tonight we have uh, Dave, Golf 4 Delta Papa Zulu uh, with us this evening. I'm going to ask him to unmute just in a second and give, him the, give us a wee introduction uh, about him, who he is and everything else. Um, but uh, if you're uh, watching tonight and you want, to, you want to see the other lectures that have gone before, check out our YouTube channel, uh, www.youtube.com forward slash M-U-A-R-C media. And that will give us all the lectures that have gone before. And just for your info, if this is your first night, we run on the second and the fourth Tuesday of every month. The fourth, uh, depending on where you are in the world, it's the second and fourth Tuesday evening uh, at 7 p.m. UK time uh, every uh, every month. So. We have a few planned for the next uh, coming month uh, and into December, uh, and then we'll be looking at uh, maybe uh, post-Christmas and everything else. So you're more than welcome to join us this evening, and we're so glad you're here again. Dave, how are we doing? Fine. That work okay? Yeah, uh, it works great. Works great. I was commenting. I thought I had the, the, the best background picture, but honestly, yours is just out of this world. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll talk about uh, Tim Peake uh, later on in the uh, presentation. Well, I'm Dave Johnson, uh, G4DPZ. I've been licensed since about 1970, or something like that. Um, I've been a member of uh, AMSAT UK and AMSAT North America for about the same length of time. I'm now on the uh, AMSAT committee. Uh, I've been doing that for about uh, 14 years, 15 years. And I organise the uh, AMSAT uh, colloquium, or certainly organise the uh, list of speakers that uh, we do either face to face, or this year we had a, our own Zoom meeting. And uh, thanks to Philip, um, who came in to one of our evening sessions, uh, persuaded me to come along and uh, and do this. So this is going to be a set of uh, a bit of history, um, a bit of um, what we've done. Uh, where we are now and where we're going to be going with uh, amateur satellites in the UK and uh, around the world. Around the world being, of course, a big pun. Sorry about that. Anyway, here we go. Let's, uh, let's see if my, my um, share screen will work. Working well, working well, yeah. Uh, is that okay, Dave? Fine. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm a member of AMSAT UK for many, many years. I'm also a member of uh, ARIS, which I'll talk about later, which is the uh, amateur radio on the International Space Station. Um, and I'm also a member of the FUNQ team. Uh, AMSAT UK have been involved with AMSAT uh, in the Netherlands to launch our own satellite. So I'll talk about that. So as we go on. Uh, there's a bit of uh, the subtitle was sort of what, how, when, where, who, what do we do, how do we do it, you know, all the usual things. Um, that was the working title. It sort of, it sort of uh, di digressed from there to some extent as, as, as I've written it. AMSAT UK um, has been going about 27, maybe 30 years, we think. Um, it grown, it, it's grown over the years uh, to a membership of about 500 now. Um, it was something like 1,500 uh, over the years, but as satellite technology has changed, they've gone from small satellites into um, elliptical orbit, orbit satellites like AO10, AO13, when it's a worldwide audience, and we gained a lot of membership. Um, as did our North American colleagues. Um, but we're, we're, we're quite happy. Um, it's, it's public domain knowledge that um, if you want to look at the accounts, we've got something like 140,000 pounds in the, in the budget or for satellite building. Um, 
we do a lot of uh, contributions to um, other satellite teams as well, be their academic, be their amateur radio. Um, so we sponsored things in North America, we sponsored things in Germany, um, South America, Africa, and uh, what comes around goes around. It, it, it's a really good STEM outreach for us. So we, we design them, we build them, we, fu we fund them. Um, the satellite you can see on there is Funky One, um, which was built in collaboration with uh, AMSAT in the Netherlands. Um, it's built um, as a 1U cube, it's 10 centimetre cube, um, UHF, VHF transponder, and a lot of STEM uh, experiments on board. Um, it's been going eight years now, and it's only failed three times which is quite good in, uh, in terms of uh, satellite operations. We think a couple of those are finger, tr finger trouble by operators, but um, we're not gonna, we're not gonna think go any further into that. Um, we started very small. We started in a strange way um, in North America. Um, just after Sputnik had gone up, we, um, our American colleagues um, working for NASA, uh, and NORAD at the time, uh, they were launching um, fairly, fairly primitive satellites into space, with basically with one major satellite on board. To get the mass balance right, they put concrete blocks around the top of the satellite. So some of our friends in North America said, well, how about if we took one of those concrete blocks off and put a, put a small satellite on board? And you can see it's almost the, it's the edge of a ring if you look at the shape of that, and one of the blocks was taken out, that was slotted in place. Run on batteries, a very, very small power uh, transmitter on two meters, and it went for 312 orbits. And it's probably still up there somewhere. We've gone from um, being a concrete block replacement a long way through satellites but a lot of it has been through um, academia in the early days. This is a picture of Professor Martin Sweeting uh, on the right hand side with hair. He doesn't have quite so much these days. I think, I think this is uh, Oscar, two, Oscar seven, I think possibly, or maybe earlier. Anyway, if this works, Martin's gonna say a few words about um, his um, experience in getting into our the radio and, and why we are where we are now, if this works. Hello. I hope that you and your family are well and managing in these difficult times. You will see that I'm sporting a lockdown beard. The jury is out as to whether this is an improvement and I guess time will tell. Nevertheless, I'm often asked as to how and why I got involved in satellites and spacecraft. Well, I'm a child of the Apollo era. I watched Neil Armstrong coming down the ladder onto the surface of the moon and I watched 2001, that epic space movie. Both of those fired my imagination for space. At the same time, I was a radio amateur. I designed and built transmitters and receivers and aerials and talked to people around the world at a time before the internet made it so easy. So when I went to university, a group of my friends and colleagues got together in radio society and set up a small satellite tracking station to monitor some of the early radio amateur satellites in low Earth orbit. We then became more ambitious and started to track some of the American and Soviet weather satellites, decoding their data and displaying images from space at a time when this was not commonplace. The next step seemed sort of logically, if I couldn't be an astronaut and I wanted to get involved in space, perhaps I could build a spacecraft and put it into space. So by going around and scrounging, begging, borrowing, not stealing quite, but almost many facilities and equipment and components and getting advice from many people, including AMSAT, we started to design and build our first small satellite, USAT-1. It took us about two and a half years, and when we completed it and tested it, we took it to the US, where NASA 
provided a free launch on a Delta rocket in 1981. The mission was a great success. Although it had its problems, we were learning a lot by, uh, about flying satellites. The first time we'd ever done that, of course, so we had no computers. All the orbital dynamics had to be done in our head, and we had no computers to generate and analyze the data. But nevertheless, during that time, we retrieved a great deal of information from the satellite, and perhaps above all, we proved that commercial off-the-shelf components could be used reliably in space on a small satellite that could be built with a tiny team in a university research lab and launched as a piggyback on a larger rocket. Perhaps this, this was, in fact, USAT-1 was perhaps the first modern microsatellite, and it sort of laid the foundation stone for what has become the new space industry. USAT-1 operated in orbit for eight years. It was in a low Earth orbit, 550 kilometers, sun synchronous. However, that meant that the orbit gradually decayed, and after eight years, it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, we monitored it falling through the atmosphere, getting hotter and hotter until it burns up in the Indian Ocean, across the Indian Ocean. So USAT-1 generated a great deal of interest amongst radio amateurs and school children and colleges around the world who could track the satellite using very simple handheld equipment. And this, of course, stimulated our interest in what to do next. And plans started for USAT-2. I've been asked, what is my most satisfying mission? Well, it's a really difficult question to answer because every satellite has had its own flavor, its own trials, tribulations, successes, and uh, benefits and so it's a it's a difficult choice to make i think probably i if i had to choose one it's possibly usat 2 it was the most challenging mission that we undertook because we had to go from being told that we had a launch in just six months time to redesign the satellite from scratch build it test it get it to the launch site integrate it and launch it all within that period of time and we were working actually something like 18 hour days in order to do it, including weekends and no holidays and so forth. So with a small team that was physically and psychologically a really demanding mission, but we did it. We were still building the last bits of the satellite actually at the launch site, but we didn't dare tell the uh, launch authorities. The satellite still continues to operate uh, today. It transmits in orbit, unfortunately the telemetry has been garbled by the radiation environment that it experiences, but it still transmits on a 10-day cycle and is, is tracked by hundreds of radio amateurs and other enthusiasts around the world who use it as a beacon. So that's still, you know, what some nearly 30 plus years after being launched. So in a sense, that's been our most satisfying mission. But of course, all the others, getting the first images from space, getting high quality uh, Earth observation data, uh, or each this mission is a, has a special place. So it's very difficult to choose one, but I think if I had to choose one, it would be USAT 2. If I had to choose my second favorite mission, I think it would have to be USAT 12. It was our first mini satellite. It was the first satellite to have three axis control, onboard propulsion, and a high resolution imager, and also to be able to take uh, high quality multispectral uh, data. So it was a, a real stepping stone from our 50 kilo box shaped microsatellites into something that's substantially bigger. And it paved the way for the work that we were going to do eventually on Galileo. It provided a lot of the technology that we used in our future constellations. And it, it demonstrated to the world that actually we could build at Surrey a satellite which was not just a 50 kilo cube. And that mission really did change the perception of SSDL. It also was a leapfrog in our capabilities and then set us on the path to many of our future missions and of course the constellations that we've subsequently built for Earth observation. There was another element of USAT-12 which made it special. And that was, it was the first launch on the Dnieper launcher, the converted SS-18 uh, intercontinental missile. That was an exciting time. We bought the missile for a million dollars. Uh, they changed the software to keep going up instead of coming back down again with the warhead uh, to deploy us into orbit. And it was the first, not just for us as the first mini satellite, but also for the first commercial launch of the uh, what was then to become the Dnieper launch vehicle, which we used on subsequent uh, missions very successfully. 
So all in all, that's another mission that has a special place in my, in my heart. So Martin is our uh, chairman uh, of AMSAT UK. Um, really nice bloke, incredibly bright. Um, he's also the uh, chairman of the RCCF, the um, amateur radio charity that's associated with the, uh, with the RSGB. Um, over the years, um, AMSAT UK has been the beneficiary of quite a few legacies. I mentioned before how much there are in the funds. Um, we have uh, one very generous gentleman that I know, well, who occasionally remain anonymous, made a significant uh, gesture into our funds, uh, which will fund the next uh, next launch for us. So we've been extremely, extremely grateful to a lot of people over the years. Thank you, Martin. Martin mentioned a lot of satellites that he's been involved with. Um, currently there are 40 active satellites and the number goes up, it seems like every day at the moment. Um, our friends in North America uh, are launching a lot of academic uh, CubeSats. Um, our friends in Germany are doing the same as well. Um, there are quite a few STEM outreach um, things in pro progress, even in the UK. Um, there are a couple of universities um, thinking about uh, doing launches. We have some unfortunate um, legalities in the uh, in the UK that um, whereby a satellite has to be licensed twice. It has to be licensed by Ofcom, and it has to be licensed by the UK Space Agency. The Ofcom license is the Spectrum license, of course, but the uh, UK Space Agency require um, a set of insurances that if it goes up, if it comes down again, <laughs> you certainly want insurance. Um, and they are talking multi-million pounds uh, insurance policies. Um, and for a university that's launching at something 10 centimetres cube, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to undertake that exercise. Um, so, Hence, um, I mentioned earlier that, uh, um, that FUNQ1 is a, a, co a collaboration between AMSAT UK and AMSAT NL. Dutch licensing um, authorities have a different model for their insurance and licensing. So we sold the intellectual property rights and the engineering model to AMSAT NL for one euro. So, they command it, um, they have ownership of it, um, and we, we fund it basically. That, that, and that, that, that's, the way it's, uh, that's the way it's planned out. And it's worked extremely well for seven years. But as you can see, I, I, I digress slightly there. 40 satellites in orbit. Some of them, as Martin said, are going back 30 years. We've had some surprises along the way. Um, Oscar 7, which is probably about the 10th one down, um, was launched about 25 years ago, probably more than that now. Um, we thought we'd lost it, and then all of a sudden, as these things happened, it burst back into life again, because the batteries, uh, the Nikar batteries on open circuit, they were being powered by the solar cells, so when it comes in the sunlight it works, when it goes into the eclipse it turns itself off again. The problem is we never know what mode it's going to come up in. So it can come, it come, in, it can come into uh, UHF or it can come into AHF. And we, it, it, so it's, it's always a lottery to which one it's going to come up in. But it's a fantastic satellite, even now. I alluded to how many satellites are going to be coming up in the next 10 years before, I, as, as I was talking about this. These are the planned satellites for people like SpaceX doing their internet, of internet around the world. And I'll stop it when it gets to 2029 if I, can, if I can catch it in time. There we go. 
Oops, let's get rid of that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't, I'm, the, the pop-ups and the images are on the corner of my screen, so I can't take down the, um, the pop-up that it's just given me. Um, something like 57,000 planned satellites in the next 10 years. People like SpaceX and all the other people doing internet comms, um, Earth observation satellites, which I which I'm only involved with, and um, lots and lots of things. You, you can see it's really busy. The worry, of course, is there will be a cascade event. One satellite hits another, hits another, hits another, and the whole thing just blows into, into tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of small pieces. I think currently the... Um, Tracking is for something like 20,000 um, pieces, something in the range of about five centimeters large. As soon as you get 57,000 solid pieces, if they break up, it's a huge amount of debris. Um, there are uh, organizations um, designing satellites for, um, for recovery of this, of this, uh, of this garbage. In fact, the University of Surrey, where Martin is from, did a satellite last year. Um, it, took on, it took with it a small satellite. It took with it a net. It took with it a harpoon, both of which worked, fortunately. Uh, we didn't, they, didn't lose them, they didn't lose the small satellite. So there, was, there was a demonstration of it. And the satellite in the end extended a um, mylar sheet, which acted like a brake, a parachute, umbrella, whatever you want to call it, and it deorbited afterwards. And that's what a lot of the deorbiting de uh, systems are going to be using. Um, the Federal Communications Authority in the US are now mandating that any new, new launches will have to have deorbit capability. I've talked about orbits. <coughs> An orbit basically is how, how hard and fast you throw something. The usual, usual thing is, it, it, it is, is a cannon somewhere near the Earth's surface. And it's going to go about, two, it's going to go about 200 meters. The higher up you get, the harder you've got to throw it. And once you get to about uh, 230 miles, you've got to throw something at about 17,500 miles an hour. That's what the ISS is doing at the moment. So every time it comes over, you see the white dot in, in the sky in the evening. It's, it, it, it's obvious that it's the ISS. It's traveling much faster than the aircraft would. But it is doing that speed just, just to stay up there. Um, even at that height, 230 miles, there is uh, atomic oxygen, which is enough to cause drag. So every so often when they send up a uh, supply vehicle, they'll give, the, they'll give the ISS a boost. Or, um, I've talked about debris, even the ISS at that low level of LEO has to avoid debris. So occasionally they'll give it a boost just to, get, just to make sure it doesn't get in the way of something. Tonkyu 1, which I mentioned earlier, we've had the same problems. Um, NORAD um, and CONSPEC in the States do collision uh, uh, warnings. We've been within 200 meters of another item in space, head on. So it could have been 39,000 miles an hour impact. We were okay. We got away with it. I talked about Leo. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about the, each of the um, orbit types, and then talk about what sort of satellites we've got up there in each of the orbits. Leo, as it's obviously it's called, it's low Earth orbit. Um, it's about 160 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers. The ISS sits at about 480, I think, 380, something like that, 380, 400. It goes up and down a bit, but it's the lowest thing in low Earth orbit. Everything is mandated to be above the ISS. 
they don't want things to they don't, they don't, the, the Americans don't want things crashing into it. So if a um, CubeSat or something is launched from the ISS, it's launched in what's called a retrograde orbit. So it will always fall below the ISS almost immediately. So a lot of the things that are pushed out of the ISS are short-term experimental satellites, which will burn up within a couple of months or so, but they'll always be, be below the ISS. I talked about um, ARIS, amateur radio, on the International Space Station. Well, you can see there, just in the middle of the picture, there's a, a 710 which has been modified heavily for um, space use. It's been space rated. Um, the functions on it are basically for APRS and high power FM and it operates in repeater mode as well. Um, it's, made to be sim it's made to be simple so the astronauts only have to hit a couple of switches. You know, they're busy people. They don't want to read the manuals. This is the third piece of equipment I think that's gone up there. There have been other, other, other devices which have either been there for so many years they failed or uh, they're just not, not powerful enough to do the job. Um, let me move on to the next slide. That's a better, that's a better picture of it. Um, it was um, sent up um, with SpaceX in uh, 2020. Um, the device you see behind it, the, um, the, the, the Chrome box, um, is the power supply. It's a big power supply. The problem is on the ISS, there's the American side and there's the Russian side. The American side run at 110 volts. The Russian side work at 28 volts DC. So we have to have a universal power supply. So if they, if they carry the rig from one part of the ISS to the other, they can just plug it in and it, and it will work. Um, <laughs> to say, all leads, all cables on the ISS are white. <laughs> There's no color coding. It's all done on the labeling because they, 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 there is some mandate that um, it has to be a specific wire type. It's, be, it's got to be space rated. And for whatever reason, if you look in the if you look in all the ISS photographs of their equipment floating around, everything looks white. Outside, it makes sense. It's it, it's UV resistant. Why it seems why it's white inside, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so we, we talked about we, we talked about the the seven ten works a repeater. Um, works for the school downlinks uh, 25 watts. The interesting thing is that because um, there is no convection on the ISS, cooling anything is a problem. So they've had to uprate the fan on the back of the 710 to get some cooling into it. You can probably see it on, on the back. It's actually, the, there, is, there is another picture somewhere that I don't think I have. But they've, got, they've had to go to quite a lot of extent to make sure the cooling works at 25 watts. I'm just going to come out of these slides into, um, into another set. Bear with me a second. This is from one of my colleagues, um, Kieran. Um, Kieran Morgan. Um, M0XTD, who's the um, UK lead for ARIS. Uh, this was a set of slides he did um, at the convention. Uh, Dave, is that okay? Okay. Um, which he ran at the uh, AMSAT colloquium a few weeks ago, um, talking about what ARIS is, is doing at the moment. So we're up to the interoperable radio system. And there's a little surprise on, on the end of this. There is a, where we're going. It's been a very quiet year. Uh, COVID's hit is really hard. Um, we'd normally do 
something like three schools contacts a year, whereby we go into a school, provide all the radio equipment, and something like 12 or 14 children will have the ability to talk to the astronaut, like Tim Peake behind me. Um, this year we've done, we've done none at all, but we've used uh, telebridges and, and Zoom, so whereby, whereby um, a couple of stations around the world will act as ground stations talking to the ISS and the children will um, Zoom call or telebridge through, through that one station. We have an interesting one coming up um, April next year. It's for a school for the deaf. Now, how we're going to go about that one is going to be rather challenging. There's going to be an awful lot of signing being done, I think, um, and an awful lot of subtitles. But um, we, we've, uh, we've, we've yet to get to that point. But I'm sure, I'm sure like all the ones we've done, we enjoy it. The, 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 the children enjoy it. It's, it's, it's so much fun. Um, there was an event called the Electromagnetic Field, uh, which happens in uh, Herefordshire uh, during, uh, twice every two years. And we'd set up to do um, a big event. This is, this is an event with two and a half thousand people. Um, it had to be cancelled because of COVID. Um, but we've told them all we've done is put it on the, we've put, we take the file, we put it to one side, two years time, we'll pull it out and you can have the contact again. So I'm, I'm jumping ahead to next year. <coughs> Worldwide operations, um, everything works out of NASA. Um, most of the ARIS contacts um, happen 18, well, they're, they're planned 18 months in advance because we never know what the schedule for the astronauts is going to be. We've got a time at the school. We've got a, we've got a, if, the, if the ISS gets boosted, we don't know what we don't know what the predictions are. So as we get close to the time, we find out when the event's going to happen. We lost a few of the celebrities because of uh, COVID, um, because of uh, COVID problems on schools and NASA premises. So the number of contacts went down because of that, unfortunately. As I said, COVID hit the number of uh, direct contacts. And they're now doing, um, instead of one telebridge in one part of the world, they're now doing international uh, contacts as well. So children from across the world can work through one telebridge. We managed to get a um, couple of SSTV events with our friends in uh, Irish Russia, whereby on board they have a, a PC that's running um, some SSTV software that they can fire into the back of the um, 710 fixed images. Um, we know in about sort of two weeks in advance when they're going to be sending them, but there, there's always a Gagarin event at least once a year, and people are encouraged to, to receive the uh, SSTV signals on, the, on two meters. We have something called Ham TV on, on board. Um, which is a digital uh, DVB2, I think, um, downlink uh, on L band, um, sorry, I beg your pardon, on S band, um, which we use in, con in conjunction with the um, ISS contacts. Um, we did the first one where Tim Peake went up with Principia um, about four years ago. Um, the, we actually got it in the school. On the, on the first morning, we turned it on. So we had, we, had two, we had two really good events at the same time. I talked about that. This is, um, you can see I nicked the slides for this in my own set. That's a bit, bit of a closer, closer um, image of the, uh, of the device. As I said before, everything, all the cables are white, but probably a blue network cable, I think there's some. This is the next step. I'm probably jumping out of my slides a little bit here, but so here we go. The amateur radio on the lunar gateway. Um, everybody said, oh, you'll never get away with that. Even, even if you propose it, NASA wouldn't be interested. NASA were interested. 
it's been the case that for every um, space station that's ever gone up there, Mir, the ISS, now, now RX, there's always been a piece of amateur radio equipment on board because it's the backup. If all the other systems fail, amateur radio, even though it's low power, it will, it will still work. They used it on Mir um, when they did the um, space shuttle uh, Mir um, version on Midu, because that's the only common thing they had was amateur radio because the Russian and um, American frequencies are completely different on different modes. So they agreed to use amateur radio for the, for the initial contact. Anyway, going back to RX. Um, it's a proposal at the moment. Um, it looks something like a Zvezda, the first um, part of the ISS. It's probably about the same size. We're going to have a, a couple of antennas on board maybe X-band, maybe S-band, um, again, for, for the uh, possible uh, emergency comms, but mainly for STEM outreach. It may just be a beacon. It may not have a transponder on board, but we've made the right noises and they, and they are very interesting. Um, one thing I haven't put on here is that our friends in Germany, and I'm sat to DL, uh, are also talking about um, putting some equipment on a lunar lander. Uh, but that's in the very early, early stages of uh, a concept at the moment. Okay, I say, I've said enough about that one, so I'll come back to me on slides. Hey, it worked. <laughs> Talked about low Earth orbit on the ISS. The next sort of step is the sun synchronous orbit. Dave, how am I doing for time? Fine. Okay. Talked about sun synchronous orbits. Well, basically, they're almost a polar orbit. Um, if you look at the sort of um, shape of the Earth off to one side, if I, have, if I was uh, being graphic and you could see my hands, uh, you'd see the sun was off, at one side, off to one side there by 93 million miles. Um, so the orbit is uh, inclined such that um, it's all, the satellite is always facing the sun. It's always getting solar power. Um, so it, it's fixed position and basically the, the Earth rotates underneath the satellite. So in, in theory, 24 hours later, it'll be in the same place by the number of orbits it's made. So typically, um, a sun-synchronous satellite makes about 14 orbits a day. So it's, it, it, it goes over most of the Earth's surface in the, in the, during those orbits. So I know that if, if, I'm Brum, if I'm in Brum where I am now, if I see a satellite at about 9.30 in the morning, Following day, I'll see probably about 9.35, following day 9.40. So it does drift a little bit, but we'll always come back to the same time point eventually. There's a lot up there. I've said there's um, 40 active. It's actually probably more than that. I'm going to come out of the screen in a second and uh, show you how many there are. But typically, um, a pass of a satellite takes between four and 12 minutes, depending what, on the elevation of the satellite as it comes over the horizon. The ISS, because it's um, fairly quick, is with us for about 12 minutes. So you're trying to get 12 children or 14 children to ask the astronaut the question and get the answer back as well. Our record, is, our record for doing both is 17 questions. I think we may, we may have actually done 18 in that time. So we, we, we rehearsed the children extremely well to, to be able to do that. I'm just going to come out of, uh, out of this and hopefully I'll find another application. It's going to play for me.
No, he's not going to play. Sorry, David. Can you see, see me, Dave? Okay. Yeah, yeah, come, Dave. yeah sorry. Uh, yeah, what I, was, what I was trying to demonstrate was how, how many satellites there are. Um, but I can't, uh, the, I can't drop the slideshow into the uh, application. Um, there are something like um, 50 satellites I can track all at the same time. So imagine that window that's there with 50 footprints on it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant number. Um, I'll tell you more about trying to do that in my, my day job at the end. Um, but there are um, something like 17 um, FM satellites at the moment and maybe 10 linear transponders. Um, over the US, uh, the FM satellites are like the Tower of Babel. Everybody's shouting at them. In, the, uh, in Europe, it's actually not quite so bad. Um, I saw a lovely demo done by um, two Australians today uh, with a rubber duck antenna on a handheld. And basically, he, 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 he managed to get through the satellite just with a... With, um, I don't think it was a bay of fang. <laughs> but it, it, it was something... I think it was a little better than that. Um, but basically, it was two handhelds to each other. And the joke is that when we used to do when we used to do demos, we'd be stood next to each other with a pair of handheld antennas and more and uh, handheld radios, and we, we're ten feet apart, but we we've done four and a half thousand miles and four and a half thousand miles back. Um, okay, uh, what was I going to do next? This is the sort of typical um, base station um, antenna that's uh, in, in use around the, around, the, around the place. This is what I've got. Uh, th this isn't mine. This is, uh, is uh, 2M0 SQL up in the uh, far north of Scotland. Um, so it's a pair of crossed Yagis and a Helix. So that's uh, 70, uh, two meters and uh, an L band. Uh, with a Yersa rotator, so it rotates in azimuth and in elevation. Um, that, one's, that one will be computer controlled as well. As I said, there's a lot up there. There are amateur satellites, CubeSats, which are the academic satellites, the ISS, Earth observation, lots and lots of different things. If I try, if I try and uh, drop out of this and try and find another, let's hope this one works. Yeah, okay. CQ-FO29 from Mike stroke Kilo Oscar 4, Mike Alpha. Mike stroke Kilo Oscar 4, Mike Alpha, the answer you take a look at. CQ-CQ-CQ-FO29 from Mike stroke KO4NA, Mike stroke KO4NA, the answer you take a look at. So that was uh, Drew, KO4MA, who's the uh, Vice President of Operations from AMSAT North America, uh, doing a demo at the uh, colloquium a couple of years ago. Um, he was using a pair of uh, FT817s uh, strapped together uh, with a handheld uh, antenna. 
So you don't have to use the, uh, the big rig that's uh, on the screen here. You can go for something a, a good deal smaller. Um, if, I was, if I was to turn this, uh, no, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you later, when, right at the end when I bring my own screen up, I've actually got a pair strapped together here as well. So we've gone through a couple of orbits. Um, over, the, over the years, we've tried to do things um, a little, um, a little larger in life. Um, this one is a highly elliptical orbit, out about 60,000 kilometers. Um, and here's the beast that did it. It's quite a large satellite. This is AO40. And the gentleman on the right hand side is Peter Gulzow, DB2OS, who's the uh, chairman, so president of uh, AMSAT uh, DL. Um, this satellite is, as you can see, how big it was. Most of the inside of that is power, is, 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 is thrust, is thrust um, uh, elements. So it's fuel tanks, um, oxidizers, as well as the electronics. It was quite a beast. Um, and you can see what on the top there is one rocket nozzle. And hidden underneath it in the um, launch adapter is another rocket nozzle. The idea being that once it gets to the lowest point in Earth orbit, you fire the rocket and you get it out to 60,000 kilometers. Then you fire the other rocket to stop it going out any further. Unfortunately, they fired the first rocket and it worked perfectly. They fired the second rocket and it went bang and blew the side of the satellite off, we believe. Um, there are supposed to be tags on satellites removed before flight. It got lost somewhere. And a, an, escape val an escape valve for the, um, one of the fuel lines basically that should have uh, burst as it, if, it, if it was overpressure didn't. And it took part of the satellite out with it. So we lost, we thought we'd lost it. Christmas day, about three months later, it burst back into life again. So we've had AO7 come back and we've had AO40 come back. Um, so it lasted another two years. Um, as with all things in space, batteries degrade. Uh, unfortunately, the, CISO, the, the satellite operators weren't quite quick enough to turn it over to the, the secondary set of batteries. So it's still up there. Well, we hope one day those batteries might go up the circuit <laughs> and we'll end up working on solar cells again. It's, uh, there is a saying in the industry, space is hard. We've gone to, on to um, all sorts of um, small satellites um, near Earth orbit. We all know about so the standard communication satellites in uh, uh, geostationary. There's an alternative to the high, highly elliptical orbit that will take us out to geo. Trying to get an amateur radio satellite into geostationary orbit would cost an arm and a leg. You're talking millions of dollars. Unless somebody comes to a colloquium and says, how would you like a ride? For want of a better expression. And along comes the um, Qatari Amateur Radio Society, whose members are also part of the Qatar Satellite Company, who run SLSAT. AMSAT DL, would you like to put a payload on our geostationary satellite that we're launching, a SAIL 2? Well, of course, people jump at the chance, don't they? Um, what actually happened was um, <clears throat> the Qatari Amateur Radio Society had already sp yeah, spoken to their commercial arm and said, if we can get a design, will you fly it for us? Yes. So what happened was um, AMSA DL had a design, which they were Put, put, would, be a, would have become a payload. No, you can't put your own amateur payload on a geostationary satellite. But if you give, the, give us the design, we'll build it for you commercially. 
Well, it was just, it was something like that anyway. Um, so what happened was that the this is a normal communication satellite, broadband, TV, etc. Built by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in Japan. So Amsat DL spoke to MHI with their design. M MHI said, we've never seen anything like this before. It's just too small. How about we lend you two of our um, traveling wave tubes on board? So they've now got two 500 watt transmitters on board, one for narrowband and one for wideband. So it's narrowband um, linear transponder and a wideband DATV transponder. In reality, there are spares on board. So if the main, if any of the mains go off, they'll take one of them back. So that that's that that's the deal. But as far as as far as the Qataris are concerned, the reliability of these things will have it for several years. <clears throat> the coverage, it's impressive. It's from Brazil over to China, from the Antarctic all the way up into um, the uh, Svalbard in the north. The Americans hate us. <laughs> They, because we do, because they, they simply don't have we they don't have the coverage. If you look on the top left hand corner, it's almost into Newfoundland in Canada. So the um, the thought is that one of us might get a maritime mobile out there somewhere <laughs> off Canada and sign maritime mobile. It, it's just about within the. Um, international limit of, of Canada on, on, on the edge of the, uh, the edge of the footprint. Um, I think um, Philip probably knows the, uh, the person who is going to uh, undertake that, uh, that little trip. <clears throat> this is my um, ground station. Um, it's a, the ubiquitous uh, 9700. Um, and sat on top of it is uh, Kuna Electronics um, up converter from uh, two to um, to S band. Um, there's another piece of equipment. Uh, if you look at on the on the next uh, image across, that's a 1.1 meter dish um, with the uh, with a patch and with a uh, L and sorry with a S and X band patch under the plastic cover, and underneath the um, arm for the uh, antenna is the uh, is the down converter again from uh, Kuna. Um, works extremely well. Um, not cheap of course I can, as you can well imagine with the with Kuna equipment. Um, there are a lot of other alternatives um, which I'm going to try if I can get my next, next set of slides to come out. Uh, one of my other colleagues has done some um, this is the this is the quick and dirty way to do it set of slides. <clears throat> but in the meantime, um, dish pointing is fairly accurate on, on, on two meters. The, the, beam, the, the sort of beam with three dB point is about 30 degrees. On a one meter dish at X band, the three dB point is two degrees. So the, the pointing it takes quite a bit of quite a bit of accuracy. But there are some nice tools. Uh, that uh, AMSAT GL and the uh, British Amateur Television Club have uh, put together. So that's where I am. And it just literally misses the back of the house, but the uh, dish is in the garden, so it's, uh, it's okay. Although with, the, um, <clears throat> with Ofcom's uh, EMF um, requirements now to work out how much power you're going to be putting out, um, I did the calculation. Um, with the 15 watts into the dish, I'm putting three and a half kilowatts out at, X, at, uh, at S band. I'm still okay within the limit because I'm above people's heads. <laughs> <coughs> this is a QSO, if it works, the audio works with uh, 2M0 SQL in Elgin. Um, great circle distance, about 380 miles. 
round trip distance, 4,800 miles. You'll see what I mean about the delay when you actually hear the, when you hear the bit, if, the, if, this, if this works. Well, <clears throat> that, that was Peter. Um, it wasn't prearranged. But I thought he might be about. He's usually about during the day. Um, the image on the uh, right hand side, um, you can see uh, 70 cents and two meters. Um, 70 cents is the downlink from the IF, and the two, and the two meters is the uplink to the uh, transverter. Um, this is the 9700 is actually in satellite mode and the two frequencies are GPS locked um, to within a few hundred hertz. Um, it's, uh, it works extremely well. <clears throat> Another QSO, I, I won't actually run it, but this was with uh, 9A5YY. Um, Interesting DX on the, on the satellite. As I said, you can, I've, I've worked into BY, I've worked into China on the, uh, on the satellite, um, and as far away, and on the other way into Brazil, um, which is extremely pleasing. Um, I've got my country list just for QR100, and it's something like 42, 42 different countries, um, just from one satellite, oh, countries or prefixes at least. If this works, if my link works, here we go. <coughs> this is uh, G4BAO talking. Um, if you want to make a note of his um, URL, it's a really good uh, set of uh, information here, on here. I'll, I'll give it to uh, Dave after the uh, after the meeting. And he talks you through what um, a cell sat is. Some of it is what I've, what I've done before. Um, but I wanted to find a couple of pictures. It's got the uplink and downlink. It's got the footprint again. It's got the specs of the uh, up and down links, what, what, what's available. There is a web SDR that um, the British Amateur Television Club have provided. Um, Again, I can uh, give David the details. So basically, it's, a, it's permanently on listening to um, the satellite. It's this uh, device, excuse me, 
the device is at uh, Goon Hilly. Uh, we have some very good relationships with uh, Goon Hilly through uh, AMSAT. We have a dish down there. Um, we have uh, antennas for uh, receiving from Q1 as well. And we're tentatively talking about putting a proper ground station down there as well, but um, don't quote me on that for the moment. We talked about simple equipment. I've got a one meter dish um, in, the, in the garden. Um, 80 centimeter uh, XTV is fine. They work fine for reception. I'm trying to find the image. Um, there are a lot of um, commercial um, devices. This, I've got the Kuma equipment. Um, there are equipment from SG Labs as well extremely good. Um, I advise you to buy it now because the European, you're going to end up buying with the paying in what duty on it uh, come, uh, come January. Let me get silly. This is how cheaply you can get away with it. This is a standard LMB for your TV, which has been hacked to put what's called a potty on it, which is the patch of the year. Um, the guys who designed it now sold over 2,000 of these things. Um, it would be nice to get that amount of activity on the, on the, uh, on the satellite, but um, they work extremely well. A small bit of soldering, two, three millimeter drills, and you have yourself a patch for um, X, uh, for, um, for S-band. The plastic, bit, the red plastic bit on the front of the uh, thing isn't to keep the rain out. It's actually a lens. Because at that frequency, um, because you're putting it into something like 22 millimeter um, water pipe, it helps to actually lend, to lens the um, uh, RF signal down, down, the, uh, down the waveguide. Lots and lots of different shapes have been tried. This is one of them. The one I've got is, is conical. And you think, oh, it's just a bit of plastic. But that bit of plastic will give you 3 dBs of gain, which is quite, which is quite significant at, at that frequency. Again, it's, uh, everybody's using sort of um, either XTV dishes or something they bought. I think the one I paid about 60 quid for, um, for a one meter dish. You'll see that it's offset in the same way that TV dishes are. You can get prime focus where the um, LMB sits right in the middle of the dish, but they're not quite so um, not quite so manageable. Okay, and most radio hams like hacking. This is an LMB. Um, if you get them uh, off the shelf, they're fine for uh, digital TV for. Uh, narrowband radio, they drift, like most things do. Um, it'll drift, it'll drift about 5 kcs up and down as the temperature changes. So people are injecting uh, 25 megahertz um, uh, reference frequency into it. Uh, I think I've got about four or five in, var in, four or five in, various, bit, in various states of, um, of brokenness when I've um, not quite um, soldered the SMD right. But uh, they do work. But um, the the Kuna, so the, the Kuna equipment certainly works uh, out of the box. What else we got here? Oh yeah, um, the various people have, have um, attached their um, antennas, um, transmit and uh, and receive in various ways. Some people have actually wrapped a helical antenna around the uh, LNB itself. It's about three turns of LNB, and it uh, it seems to work okay. Um, a bit a bit of loss, but um, because the satellite is so loud, it's uh, it, it's fine. We also run DATV on uh, on board. Uh, there is a, a DATV beacon, uh, which puts out quite a bit of power. Um, the <clears throat> original intention was you got the off the shelf LNB and a DVBS2 um, decoder uh, for your TV, and you stick HDMI in one end, you stick the LMB in the other end, and you receive the beacon. That was the idea. It hasn't quite worked out like that. 
Um, there, there are lots and lots. Of, the, the, the British Amateur Television Club, their website is just full of information. This is the AMSAT DL about the number of hacks you can do to, uh, to get it to work. But that's been the joy of QR100, be it um, operating on narrowband uh, or operating on DATV. The, the experiment op experimental options have just been wonderful. And the picture on the bottom uh, right-hand side is the beacon. That's one of the uh, Qatari um, uh, members. I think it's probably broadcast on the very first day. And as you can see on the bottom left-hand side, people are a bunch of hackers putting this, uh, putting this stuff together. I'm not quite sure who that is, but I think about, I, probably, I probably know. As I said, uh, look at g4bao.com. You'll find all this uh, information on there. Let's go and come back to my slides again. We've talked about um, going to the moon. We've talked about um, uh, talked about geostationary satellites. Um, our friends in uh, AMSAT, uh, Germany, AMSAT DL, set themselves a challenge. Could they hear Voyager 1? This is the uh, antenna dome at Bochum in, uh, in Germany, which is uh, owned by AMSAT DL. Um, there, are, there are quite a few people involved in this, of course. Um, not professional deep space engineers, but have enough knowledge to put the bits together. The problem with that sort of um, distance and um, Doppler shift and loss is that the amount of power coming back is infinitesimally small. Um, so you have to integrate a lot of um, basically noise to get the, to get the signal out. <coughs> the the um, device is putting out about 85 watts. Path loss is about 320 dBi. Um, the antenna gain in Bochum is about uh, 61 dBi. And there's quite a bit of noise because of the moon and the basically sky noise. So they're expecting, they calculated that one hertz, they get an 8 dB gain out of the system. The signal was 2 dBs above the noise. And they got it. They had to, unfortunately, they got the... <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, mm, 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 mm. David, um, it's Roy here from uh, Lock Iron. I was just wondering, um, you know, for somebody starting to track or work uh, the satellites, which is there any particular satellite that you would recommend? Oh, let's think. Um, probably one of these is one of the FM satellites. So um, AO91 is probably probably one of the best. Uh, it, it, over Europe, it will be extremely noisy. Uh, and, and I don't mean in terms of noise, but in terms of the, the number of operators coming through it. Um, okay. what, I will, what I will do is I'll, I'll give David a, um, a list of all the, all, all the satellites um, and all the popular frequencies, and I'll get him to distribute that if that's okay. That would be very useful, yeah. It'll be extreme, yeah. That's my problem. When I, any time I've went to do it or look at it, you know, I, you can never work out which is the most, you know, easiest uh, satellite to pick. You know, um. so, certainly a lot of the one, um, certainly the two meter ones are very loud, um, and the and the seventy sevens ones are are not too bad. So if you got if you got a white stick, if you got a collinear, um, not a problem at all. Certainly the um, the ISS is the loudest of all. Um, but it's not necessarily on all the time. It depends on what what the astronauts are doing, um, and if there's the they they are limited by um, if they have an EVA, they tend to turn everything off. So we we we, we know about a week in advance when the ISS is going to be on. Okay, thank you. David George GI four SJK. Um, obviously, a lot of people have listened to the satellites and they're just using their normal uh, vertical antennas um, and maybe don't want to go to a full-blown 
um, azimuth and elevation rotator and a pair of Yagis. Uh, What, um, in your experience, would you maybe recommend if you want to have a better experience on the satellite but don't really want to invest maybe upwards of a thousand pounds or more on an antenna system? You can certainly do it with a normal Yagi. If if you have the opportunity to, to raise the Yagi by about 15 degrees, maybe five degrees, you'll get you'll get more benefit because a lot of a lot of the time overhead, uh, sorry, the satellite doesn't spend much time overhead. It's usually on the horizon where you're actually making most of the contacts. So a, 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 a pair of a 70 sems and, and two meter Yagi, you'll do fine. I noticed a lot of the big stations would have pre-amplifiers on as well, uh, but for to get started, obviously. I've got, um, the only reason they have pre-amps is to overcome the, uh, overcome the coax loss. So I've mm. got a pair of um, SSB pre-amps um, on the antennas. The gain is turned down to minimum, because all I'm doing is overcoming the coax loss. Otherwise, you just introduce noise into the system. Yeah. Dave, have a fantastic evening with lots of information and uh, I know you're involved in Aris, so maybe this is a bit of a loaded question, <laughs> but have you ever thought about coming to schools in Northern Ireland and doing an Aris activation? Well, if you, if you talk... Oh, have. Yes. Yeah, um, G3V, uh, Carlos, Carlos G3VHF has, uh, has been over, as far as I know. Uh-huh. Uh, the GB4 fun. They did a telebridge from uh, one of our campuses down okay. in Skin. But yeah, there's, you know, once, once COVID's uh, disappeared, um, if there's a school that wants to make a proposal, we'd certainly be interested. He's gone again. Uh, no, no, I'm still here. <laughs> you, you just moved on the screen, that was why. And David, that has to be 18 months in advance, is that right? Is that what you said? 18 months, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Terry, G3 VFC, take two on the clock, hello. Um, One thing that I've noticed from uh, uh, local amateurs and indeed on the uh, video of uh, the chap uh, dancing around, waving uh, possibly an arrow. uh, Yes, it was an arrow, it was an arrow, yes. yes. Um, I'm puzzled as to why that seems to be um, such a ubiquitous way of doing it. Uh, dancing around and swinging wildly, you know, plus or minus uh, 50 degrees. Um, I might have thought, since uh, you can do it with an, uh, uh, a rotator, uh, which is programmed to follow the arc of the uh, satellite, I'm puzzled that people, more people, uh, don't do something simple um, in the way of, uh, pardon me if I talk the wrong language, but a polar mount, but uh, uh, inclined such that it follows the expected arc. And um, it's just then a case of rotating in azimuth. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't see anybody doing that, though, and I puzzle. No, I, I, I think it's just, I think it's just convention. People have got the XY, de- XY devices, and, and, and with computer control, it's so easy. Yes. I, I understand where you're coming from. But I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm doing that. I have. I have. Points. So it is done, but not very often. I think. Not very often. No. It's good. It's convention to use one of these. One of these. One of these mechanical. One of these X Y rotors. Yeah. That's certainly true. When I was working in um, uh, navigation, we um, used um, a polar mount thing. It used to go up and over. But, um, people couldn't get a grip of that, really, so they um, tended to understand the um, X and Y mounts a lot better. Yeah. Mm. Anyone else have any questions there for Dave before uh, before we call it this evening? Uh, it's been a, a great uh, great presentation, Dave. You're welcome. Uh, George, GI4SJQ again. Uh, thank you very much again, Dave. 
uh, David, um, mm-hmm. the the system you described for the for fixed antenna at an angle I've, I've tried and used for about six months and actually had uh, quite surprising success. I got across the pond on the A07 yes. in the east coast of the States. Um, and it was, a, it was a four element on two and a five element on 70 cents with a, a duplexer connected at the rig end. To, uh, our diplexer connected at the rig end to, uh, to get them all up on coax. Um, there are, if you look online and anybody is so inclined to go building, some very good projects coming out of Australia on uh, very simple lightweight azimuth and elevation rotator systems yep. based on Arduino and Raspberry Pi and small DC motors. And they'll take something like an arrow or an elk antenna and they'll point it directly at the satellite for you. And as was described, it'll track it across mm. the scale. Mm. Better than having a, an aching wrist. <laughs> yes, yes. I've got, I've, got, I've got an elk antenna, which is a log periodic, which is slightly different, which is actually different to the, uh, to the arrow. And once you've been holding it for about five minutes, you know, <laughs> I've had enough. That's not that's, 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 yeah, I find the trick was to extend the boom back with a brush shaft or a length of PVC pipe and tuck it under your arm. Thank you. Uh huh. Still got sore after a while, but it is too longer. Yeah. No. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for these um, modifications to make things easier to use. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, if there's no one else has any other burning questions uh dave thank you again so much for a, a great evening um we're back again in two weeks time uh for a tuesday night lecture with uh gordon west whiskey bravo 6 november oscar alpha uh, and he's going to be talking about emergency comms in california uh, and how they respond uh using their licenses and everything else and the american version of uh the UK Raynet uh, and everything else. So that's in two weeks' time uh, here on uh, the Tuesday Night Lecture Series. So, Dave, from all of us here, uh, thanks for taking the time out. It's been great, great information and uh, great to see that the satellite community is uh, increasing over the next amount of years for amateur radio and hopefully it'll keep us a bit more busier uh, in the evenings uh, ahead. So, Dave, again, thanks so much. Mm. It's, it's, it's going to keep me occupied in my, in my, in my retirement whatever happens <laughs> Cheers, guys. thank you thank all you. the best bye bye bye, bye. 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 bye.